I just thought I was going mad. I thought that's what was happening. I was so scared people were going to discover the real me because I'd always hid my emotions. At last, I started going to therapy. Did you tell people you were going to therapy? No. You hid it? Completely. And then what I realised is actually, oh, if I drink alcohol, that suppresses it. So I would spend my days filming, doing all that kind of stuff, and then in the evenings I would go out and drink. Mm. So I was living in this completely hectic lifestyle. It's a reality show which was going to be called Chelsea Girls, and then they changed the name to Made in Chelsea. I wasn't filming a scene. I thought I was in a scene anyway. So when I was with my friends or with my family, I thought I had to entertain yeah. all the time. So the only time that I could switch off was when I was sleeping which is not a good thing. So then that leads to a huge amount of social anxiety because you're basically getting an Uber rating every single time you go into a normal conversation. The only thing that I sort of took away, which was a huge benefit for me. Hey everyone, and welcome to our podcast. It's our podcast. <laughs> I'm Jamie Lang. And he basically interviewed me throughout this episode. It's very different from all my other episodes, just how this introduction is very different from all my other introductions. But we'd be so grateful if you could. Uh, you could subscribe. Follow. Follow and like this podcast and tell everyone else about it because we get deep, we get raw. It was incredible. And also, if you haven't, go and get one of these because these are <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> Hope you like our podcast. Let's get into it. Jamie. Hi. Welcome to Millennial Mind. Thank you for having me. This is so funny that you are sitting here because I messaged you two years ago. Yeah. And then you messaged me like a couple of months ago. Yeah. And I just love the whole full circle moment. I think it's so great. Well, it's what we're kind of both into, I think, is yeah. which is like that sort of manifesting. Yes. But I want to congratulate you because you are one of these people who have been on the constant hustle. Oh, it, you, you really have and it just shows you messaged me two years ago whatever it was you said this amazing message which was something along the lines of look I'm really putting myself out there to try and create this podcast and I feel like we should connect um, and you're that natural manifester which is Thank you. you know you, you, you put the, I think people are always so scared of rejection or failure or whatever it is that they never just try for sure and obviously what you do is you just that's why you're you're doing what you do right now is that you're constantly trying and pushing stuff, thank which is amazing. You. So thank you <laughs> for having me. And now I wanted to get you on my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's how it works. It's so great. But this yeah. is going to be hard for you because you're going to have to try not to ask any questions because I haven't come on yours yet. I know. I can't. So you're just going to have to control yourself and then write it all down later because I know that if I came on your first, yours first, I would be... But do urging you, to ask you. But do you see? I'm already asking questions. So yeah, I, I <laughs> here we go. <laughs> for your listeners, don't you know, I have a podcast as well. I've done a podcast for many years, so I find it really hard to not interview. And but there's something way more relaxing about being interviewed rather than being the interviewer. I I like doing both, but I think you said earlier that the pressure is mainly on the host, and I get mm. that because you're kind of like having to guide the conversation. But I also think there's pressure on you when, sorry, not to set you up for failure, um, when you're as a guest, because you want to not repeat what you've said before. You mm -hmm. want to make sure that you're being articulate. You want to make sure you're telling a story. So as long as you do all those three things today, my bracelet just fell off. As long as you do all those three things today, we'll be fine. We're all going to be coming on too. So I have a, I have a podcast, but we're actually relaunching it, 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 for lots of different reasons. And you'll be one of our first guests, which is very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. Very excited to come. But anyway, Jamie. Yeah. For people who don't know who you are. Who haven't watched the podcast, didn't watch Me and Chelsea, who don't yeah. eat candy kittens every day of their life. Tell us who you are. So I give my backstory. Okay, so um, my name is Jamie Lang. Uh, a lot of people pronounce my surname Lang, but actually it's Lang, but I've never corrected them. I do that all the time. No, you don't. You don't, actually. I think you said Lang. I, no, actually, do you I know said what, Lang. Did you say Lang? Oh, I, I, I also you know didn't what? call you, hi, Jamie Lang. No, I didn't. Did <laughs> but if I'm saying your name to other people. But people have done that for so long. So sorry. And no, honestly, don't at all. It's, it's actually... It's just been ever since I was a kid. And so e even my little brother, um, he calls himself George Lang okay. because everyone calls him it. But actually, we pronounce our name Lang because it's Scottish. Um, what can I tell you? So I uh, am one of uh, eight brothers and sisters. What? Yeah. Many no. brothers and sisters. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of divorces, three divorces in the family. So wow. a lot of different uh, halves and steps and things like that. But one of eight. Um... I went to boarding school at eight years old, which was an incredibly weird experience. Um, left school, went and decided to join this television show called Made in Chelsea. 
um, which you may or may not have heard of. But if you haven't heard of it, <laughs> it is a TV show about um, people who uh, are from a certain background, I would say. Yeah. Typically people from a... Um, a public school background or a private school education and it's following their lives and I did that for many years and it was amazing in lots of different ways and I off the back of that launched a um, confectionery company called Candy Kins, which is a vegan confectionery company and Delicious. we are uh, palm oil free and carbon neutral and lots of different things and we can go into all of that and I've just recently launched about a year ago a production company as well called Jamper Productions where I create podcasts out of so I've done podcasts and different things. That was a really long-winded... Fantastic. I don't know if it I was. I, I want to dive deep, though. Okay, you can so, ask me anything, by the way. Yeah, I'm very excited If I cross my arms, it's not because I'm closing up. It's just because I'm actually getting comfortable. It's funny because um, I was wearing a really tight dress the other day, mm -hmm. and I sat like this throughout the whole podcast, and someone commented going, she hates her guest. And I was like, I don't. I no. was just covering my stomach, just to let you know. Um, okay, you said you went to boarding school, which was a weird and fantastic thing yeah it was so weird so um i was so if i take it all the way but i was a completely hectic kid like unbelievably um <laughs> i can imagine that. oh my god i was a complete <laughs> and utter nightmare and and what's funny right is that you know i i did a podcast called private parts for many years and actually we just stopped it um and I did it for many years and actually after a few times what it became is this place that I could talk about my feelings because mm. for many years I never spoke about my feelings right and I had a lot of different things in my life that that, that not huge matter, but internally were quite traumatic to me um, and the podcast became a space that I could suddenly release and that's why I love podcasting so much. Um, and I talk very openly about having a, I started having therapy at like a certain age and that helping me through stuff, right? And what I didn't realize though, is that I thought all of my troubles, not like I said, but all of my anxiety started yeah. when I went to boarding school. But they actually didn't, they actually started before that. Actually boarding school was this place of, of complete safety. And I've only realized this recently is that um, I, I was doing this sort of workshop and people were talking about, you should go to this safe place. Right, a safe place, and you should tap either arm, and it's actually an amazing sort of technique that you can do to sort of really calm yourself down. Um, and so I was like, okay, fine. Well, let me take this to a safe place. So I was taking it to a safe place, and my safe place I always went to was boarding school. Wow. Which is really peculiar. So actually, for many years, thinking that going to boarding school was a really tricky thing, actually, it was an amazing thing. And I think that is because is that I grew up in the countryside uh, with my mum and dad, and my two half sisters, Tash and Gems, who were older than me who were from my dad's first marriage. Okay. And then I have my brother, Alexander, and my little sister, Emily. My brother, Alexander, Alexander is everything I'm not in so many ways. And he is the smartest guy I know. He, you know, studied um, classics at Oxford and is an analyst in the city and all these different things. And um, my to two older sisters were amazing, especially Tash, who is my older sister. She was like my hero because she was the coolest kid in the world. But they had come from a divorced family, so I always knew what divorce was. Okay. Without even knowing what divorce, I kind of knew what it was. Um, and so I think that fear of divorce, that happening, was always in me. I was always scared that was going to happen. To your parents? To, to my parents, and then it did happen. And so I think actually almost when the divorce happened, the divorce happened was the same time that I went to boarding school and all those different things happened at eight years old, which is kind of a sort of important time. Um... It was almost oddly like a sense of, okay, well, fine, now I can relax because that's happened. And I was anticipating it for so long. Yeah, which is a, 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 a sort of weird. And I've only sort of realized this recently. Um, so I went to boarding school, a school called Summerfields in Oxford. And um, when I arrived there, I uh, wasn't told by my parents that it was a boarding school, so I had no concept of what it was. I thought I was going to look at this other school to go to. Um, and at the end of the day of going round, you were given something called a shadow. And your shadow was the person who would watch you. He was the year above you and he would look after you. Right. If you had any issues. And at the end of the day, my shadow said, um, OK, it's been a great day. Can you go to your dorm house now? Because they call it a dorm house. And I went, no, I'm going to go home with my mum. And they said, no, no, your mum's gone home. You're staying here. And for me, I was suddenly like, what the hell? I, could, I didn't understand the concept because I was so hectic, because I was oh, so no. sort of, I suppose, ADHD. I didn't really understand the concept of what boarding school was. Um, but did anyone explain that to you? Did no. you pack your bags? No. I think my okay. parents, it's, my dad uh, was kind of off doing his thing, but my mum, I think, was too upset to explain it to me 
that she thought I'd just figure it out, which I did pretty quickly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay, yeah. I'm not going to say how I feel about that, but okay. Yeah, yeah. So it was... Um, but but school, it was an amazing experience because um, I got to play sport every day. And I've always been incredibly sporty. And so that was an amazing thing, that I had that release while playing sport. Um, and I got incredibly close friends because of it. Did any of your other siblings go to boarding school? Yeah, everyone. Everyone. Okay, so then were you kind of expecting that that was normal? Is that maybe why your mum thought, oh, he'll figure it out because that happened with everyone? Yeah, but no one explained it. My two sisters were at school, but they, I just thought that's because they would go to their mum's house or whatever, and they oh, would they would I always see. be going from one to the other anyway. And then when my brother went, um, no one explained what it was. I didn't get it. So I don't know why. Do you feel, and I'm going to now go deep with you. Okay. Have you heard of attachment styles? No. Interesting. Okay, so there's three different types of attachment styles. Can't you would love a podcast on this. I'm not an expert, but okay. I just did one with someone. There is secure. Yep. We're very secure in a relationship. Mm -hmm. There is anxious. We we're very f scared where someone's going to leave. Mm -hmm. And so you're always texting, always calling. You're like, we feel like you're always going to be abandoned. Mm -hmm. And then there's avoidant, where you're just like, mm, no, don't need you. Mm -hmm. I'm good without you. What do you think I am? Well, you tell me. Well, if you had to guess. Anxious or it avoidant. Uh, so I'm 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 the one which is uh, constantly fear that people are going to go anxious. Yeah, which makes sense because that's what happened in your childhood. Makes total sense. You would love to explore this. Yeah. I would recommend someone for you to get on the podcast. But it's it, so interesting. It's super interesting. That is, and 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 um, because a lot of the time you can turn avoidant. So I remember when I had therapy ages ago. Yeah, I said to the therapist. Well, I, I basically unlock that. Sometimes I felt like I wasn't loved. And people go two ways. Either you turn anxious and say, oh my God, I'm not loved. And so I'm going to crave love from everyone and I need it all the time. Yeah. Or you become hyper-independent, which is what I did, which is like, I don't need anyone. Like, I don't care. I just need myself. And that's avoidant. Wow. And for so long, I thought I was anxious. And when I did this podcast with this therapist, I found out I was actually avoidant. So you you become avoidant. That yeah, way. but I, I, it wasn't conscious. I wasn't like very aware that I was avoidant, but I am quite avoidant. Like I'm happy to leave a situation at any point and I will always think I'll be fine. And I recognize mm. that is driven out of fear rather than I'm going to be totally fine. But where does that drive from? Where does that emotion come from? Because I think I've been raised to be so hyper independent, which is manage everything by yourself. You'll be fine. You'll figure it out. Mm. Interesting. But anyway, back to you. That is so interesting. <laughs> that yeah. is really interesting. Yeah, I, I think definitely because of... But I was always a needy kid, like I, I, I was. Which relates to anxious attachment, yeah. Yeah, I, I was definitely super anxious. But, but the funny thing about anxiety is that it was never labelled, right? So, no. So, and almost there's a, a complete blessing in that naivety. Agree. And, and I, I've, I've said this before, but I think naivety is our biggest weapon in so many ways. And actually, when we become experienced, that's when problems start to happen. And that's why the likes of Peter Pan always wanted to stay young, right? Because mm. staying young meant that you didn't have all of this knowledge True. of this scary world out there. You know, that's why Hook was a tyrant, right? Because he had experienced all the pain and scars that life give us. It's true. Yeah, which is amazing, right? So, um, and so there was something blissful about being um, naive to it all. But I, I was a very needy kid. I was like always scared. I, I, I watched a TV show called Land Before Time. I don't know if you saw that. There was no. a TV show about dinosaurs and okay. um, dinosaurs died in it. And I would then go to bed nervous because I didn't want to die because if I died, then I'd find dinosaurs in heaven and dinosaurs were scary. So, but as a five, four, five-year-old kid, that's strange, right? Very. Why, why are you thinking about death anyway yeah. or all those things? So I was always an overthinker. Um, always, I think, was peeing my bed every night. Really? Yeah. And I was always the one, you know, kids normally are afraid of like contact or they hide behind their mum's leg or dad's leg or whatever it is. If if they said, oh, Jamie, can I have a hug? I'd always give a hug. I Aww. always wanted to be like touch things like that. Um, so being an anxious child and then being sent to boarding school probably wasn't the best idea because then that feeds into that abandonment issue. Do you remember feeling like that, though? I remember... Going to boarding school is very strange because you're thrown into an environment of strangers and you're just... I, I can remember the first night vividly. Really? Yeah, well, I was in a room called Snoopy 
Uh, that was what the room was called in a, in a house called um, Upper House. Okay. So Upper House was one of the houses that you could stay in. There was probably, how many rooms in there? Well, there was one, two, about three, seven different rooms, and they probably slept 12 boys each. So I was a room of 12 boys in a room called Snoopy, and I slept next to a guy called Pelham, and I had a Sonic the Hedgehog duvet cover. <laughs> and I remember lying in bed, just thinking, what it, like, I, I, I remember just thinking, what, I just, I, what is this? I don't understand. And actually, quite upsettingly, you, I used to sort of close my eyes and then think, okay, don't worry, when I open my eyes, I'll be back at home. So I think Aww. it was pretty, it, but I think it was pretty, pretty upsetting just because I think it was more not the idea of not being, I think I just missed my mom and missed that sort of contact. So how did that change? Did you, were you upset with your mom? Were you angry with her? No. No, I was never upset or angry at all. How interesting. It was just how, how it, I think as children, we just follow, we're, we're sheep, right? Yeah, we argue and push back and we don't want to eat vegetables or we want our sodas or whatever it is, but actually we just kind of accept things. And that's the sort of amazing thing about young kids is that they just accept what's happening. So for me, there was a complete acceptance Well, this is what happens. There was no irritation or anger or upset towards anyone. It was this what else, but I had these emotions of just being homesick. But that's interesting that you bottled it in. Oh, I didn't tell anyone. Yeah, because yeah. that's what I'm saying. When you saw, Did you see your mum the next weekend or something? No, so then the rules of the school were you weren't allowed to call home for two weeks. So you would have Jesus. to do almost a cold turkey from your parents. So no calling home for two weeks. Then after two weeks, they would come for the weekend and come visit you for something called the teddy bears picnic. <laughs> this is so funny. A eight year old, right? But I remember those first two weeks, I would lie in bed and I would get a lump in my throat. And I couldn't swallow it and I'd get this lump in my throat. Oh. And... I, and that was obviously anxiety. 100%. But no one told me. I just thought I had a lump in my throat that I couldn't really swallow that much. And did you tell anyone, like your teachers, no one? Told no one, no. Of course you didn't tell anyone. But if someone had said to me, by the way, that's anxiety, and labelled it, maybe that would have been a worse issue. Mm. And the fact that I was just like naive to it, didn't understand what it was, perhaps that was my saving grace because then I just forgot about it because the next morning I woke up, the lump wasn't there. Okay, fine, I can breathe again properly now. And when you saw your parents at that teddy bear picnic, mm. what was your reaction? Always just excited, like this is going to be great, this is going to be fun, this is going to be amazing. So that's so interesting to me because when I was a kid, this is I, I haven't really talked about this, when I was in primary school, um, I was actually bullied by the headmistress. And my mum, I think I was around a similar age. And I don't remember much, but my mum said that I used to throw up in the mornings, every morning when I went to the school. And she was actually racist. She was actually went to prison. Can you believe it? Because she, she was doing serious? this to multiple children. Yeah. But that what is used to, wild. Crazy. But what used to happen is that I used to throw up. And then one day, and I used to call my grandparents at lunchtime, and then they would come pick me up. And I remember distinctly one time being in the garden and my granddad said, Shivani, your dad's on the phone. And my dad shouted at me and said, don't call them every day because I was going to private school. Mm. They were like, you can't keep calling at lunchtime and coming home. Mm. And I was like, okay. And I remember one day, I do remember throwing up and my mom said, you can't go to school now because you've thrown up in the car. And I remember throwing up in the car and apparently I was so happy after and I was totally fine the whole day. So she knew that something was wrong. Mm. And then I remember, but she said, I never told her. I never, ever, ever told her. And then I remember one time her grabbing me through the corridor and pushing me against something, like a door. And that's the only thing I remember. And I remember someone wet themselves in the classroom because they asked her to go to the toilet and she just let them sit in their wee. What the And hell? I can't remember when my mum, I need to ask her this, but she said I never told her. And that I was just li listening to you thinking, oh, maybe that's why, you know, you haven't been able to express your feelings. Yeah. But actually, I did the same thing. Yeah, but why did you do that? Why did you not express it? Because I you don't, were scared, I don't nervous? remember. I have no idea. Like, I actually have zero recollection of why I wouldn't tell my parents. And I do remember them sending me to her house, by the way, on the weekend. How weird is that? My parents sent me to her house. I remember she had these colouring pens. I remember colouring them. But the smell of her perfume used to make me sick. Like, I used so to feel, I was so scared by her. But but that's probably because as a child she was in a position of authority, so you must think that you were doing something wrong. Maybe. Yeah, so you would... But it's weird. As children, we don't say. No, we don't. And this is why. I, I did a podcast with someone as, as well who's a sexual therapist. She said that's why when people are abused, they don't say. No, they Because you always don't. think, why wouldn't children tell you? But because... But why wouldn't children say? Children don't say because... But because as children we have this blissful thing where we believe everything that the adults say is true. Yeah. Which is which is an, an amazing thing. So you 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 think and and 
And so why on earth if someone was um, pushing you against the wall or saying things to you or making you throw up or sexually abusing you, you possibly can't think they they are doing that to you. Just think, oh, yeah. I must be doing something wrong. Yes, I think that's what it is. As a child, your brain hasn't developed, so you just know what's right and wrong, and you're the one that's doing something wrong. Anyway, sorry. That this was is, a really. This big... is turning into like a proper I know, conversation. This, I love this. this yeah. <laughs> there was a real. There was a real moment. One of the biggest. Um, Things for me that happened is like in my life is that I suddenly realized that everyone's guessing. And that for me was a really like almost upsetting moment because um, I think I, I'm so almost childlike in just the way I am, mm -hmm. in the way I behave, my sort of humor, just the, I am very sort of childlike. Um, and so as a child, I was just amazed by the world. It was just so incredible. Um, and... I always thought that you would get to a moment in your life, you would open a door and all the answers would be there. Yeah. The answers about relationships or work or business or life. And then when I got to a certain age and suddenly realized, no, wait, hang on a second, everyone's just guessing. Yeah. That was really scary for me. Because mm. then you think, well, hang on a second, there are no answers. And I have to figure it out myself. And I have to figure it out myself. And that so, was pretty scary. So you went to school. Where did, did yeah. you go to university? Yeah, so I went to I went to school. I went to Summerfields, which was the first boarding school at the age of eight to thirteen. Then I took a common entrance, what they call common entrance um, exam, and I went to another school called Radley, which okay. is in Oxford. Both are in Oxford, um, and that was incredible with so many ways. And again, I played a lot of sport, um, and I wanted to then be a professional sportsman. I wanted to be a professional rugby player. And actually, I spoke about this on uh, uh, Elizabeth Day's podcast, How to Fail, and she's yeah. incredible. She's so great. She's amazing. She's a great friend yeah. of mine. And she, um, one of my failures, she asked me, is what, you, you said, what are one of your failures? And one of my failures was uh, damaging my knee while playing rugby when I was 17 years old. And just very quickly, I, so I wanted to go pro. That's what I want to do. Have my whole blueprint in life. And we all have these blueprints, right, which is actually a really dangerous thing to have, I sometimes think. Um, and I caught the ball, ruptured my ACL ligament, and then I could never play rugby again. But it was actually one of the biggest blessings that I've ever had. I was always going to be too small. I was never going to be big enough. I was never going to be maybe good enough. I was always going to try to do it and probably would have failed doing it. But the fact that I did my knee injury meant that I couldn't pursue it anyway, so I had to find other options. Wow. And now when you reflect, you're like, that was the best yeah. option for me. How but I was the worst. I cannot tell you I was the worst like pupil possible. <laughs> I was a cheeky shit. <laughs> so all of my reports would be like, okay, one of my reports my mum read to me the other day, which said getting cross at J Jamie, I have to get cross to Jamie all the time and getting cross to Jamie is like drowning puppies. It's the most horrible thing to do. Because Aww. so I had this sort of love-hate relationship with teachers um, and all I wanted to do was play sports. So and even when I went back to my school to give a talk, uh, my housemaster said, uh, got all the teachers around and said, who does Jamie owe, uh, owe homework to? So <laughs> I never did any homework. I was always failing exams. Um, I was, I couldn't revise. I couldn't focus. I couldn't answer. I was always getting in trouble. Um, but my saving grace was this sport, right? Um, so I kind of always envisioned myself as like a naughty child, a mm. naughty kid. I was always like, well, I must be naughty. Uh, left school um, and I... Uh, decided to go to, I wanted to go to university because I couldn't play rugby anymore. Right. I uh, failed my A-levels. So I got B, C, D. Not failed, okay. but didn't do yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I decided to retake my exams. Um, and in the process of retaking them, I decided that I wanted to go to Leeds University. Okay. Uh, because my girlfriend at the time was at Leeds. So I Love thought that would be a great thing to go to. Yeah. Um, and so in the mix of my retakes, um, I went up to Leeds University all by myself. Um, I got on the train, went up there and knocked on the depart the drama department door. And just a guy came to the door, he's the head of the drama, it was out of term time, and he said hi, and I said, hi, uh, my name is Jamie Lang, I'm applying to come to Leeds, um, and I failed my exams and I'm doing retakes. And the reason why I failed is I'm terrible at exams and I, and I don't listen to that, but I really want to come here. Wow. I want to come here more than anything, I think I'd be a great student. These are all the reasons why I think I would add to this department at the university and we chatted for about two hours and he was a great guy and he said look I can't promise you anything because a lot of people want to come here but um, I, I admire your intuition and I admire the fact that you've come up here and just knocked on the door and I said okay don't worry and I got on the train and went back down to London didn't tell anyone um, and a week later I went and checked my UCAS while doing my retakes and I had an unconditional offer to Leeds no way yeah it was wild and um, 
what is sort of strange about that story is that I, I sort of truly believe in life a lot of the time. It's like sort of trying to push your boundaries as much as possible. And as much as you can put a face to a name, it helps immensely. So if you are going for that job interview um, and you've submitted an email or you've done whatever, add something a little bit extra to wow. it. Yeah, we're 100%. I, I think that... Because that's so confident and so brave. Yeah, but I think... Um, do you know what? I, I, I've been asked this many times before, right, about about what is, what you know, the, the sort of argument between private schools and state schools and all this schooling. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I try and shy away from it because I don't have an answer. I didn't pick to go there. My parents sent me there. I didn't choose that. That's my yeah. parents doing whatever it is. The only thing that I sort of took away, which was a huge benefit for me, look, Education is exactly the same. I, there, you get smart people all over the place. True. You can get sporty people in different places. Perhaps there's better facilities at my school than some other schools. Whatever it is. But the one thing that I that I do think that was instilled for me from a young age was confidence. Um, and the and the how was that done? That was done because I had to give sp- talks in front of the school. I had to give speeches in front of the school. I had to read poetry in front of schools. So I had to do drama in front of schools and I was forced into to play instruments. You had to do those things. And it builds that inner confidence sure. subtly. So I think I had that inner confidence to to go do it. But again, it was blind naivety. You know, yeah. I, just going up there. But but anyone listening, I really encourage people to do that more. Whether you want to go to a university or you want to go to a school, you want to go, I don't know, you a job or go and work in a bar or whatever it is. Just go and speak to someone and put a face to a name because remember, we're all humans. We all have yes. emotions. And if you attack those emotions, you have a much better advantage. So funny what you just mentioned. I feel like I can relate to you so much. It's very weird. Mm. I did not think this was going to happen, by the way. And I think that often, like you said, I was raised in a similar environment. Where I loved public speaking. I did Lambda. Did you know, you? English was not my first language, which people find shocking. But it was, was not. Was it not? Gujarati was my first language. Wow. And but I loved I, I used to do Lambda and I loved it. I loved drama. Yeah. And I used to like recite Anne Frank's diary and I used to that was my favourite class of the week. But I do think that confidence in that way was instilled in me. But what did you love about drama? What was I it? just love performing. I used to get ninety eight percent in all of my acting classes. I still yeah. think I wanted to be an actor one day. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I really enjoy public speaking. I really enjoy storytelling. I remember when it was like assembly, I used to go up to my headmistress and say, I have a really inspiring story. Can I can I say it in front of everyone? Or can I share my trips of my India trip that I just did? And she'd say, okay, yeah, fine, whatever, do it. But I used to really enjoy standing there on stage. I used to feel scared. I would feel nervous. I would start on my words a bit, but I would want to do it. Yeah, but it's but it's interesting you say that because there's there's sort of a few things to unpack there, I suppose, which is where yeah, uh, you had that inner confidence uh, in uh, some uh, element, in, yes, in, in the speaking element, yeah, speaking, yeah. But Sorry. what what's, what what be interesting, right, is that I imagine then you would have a huge amount of insecurities as well. Yeah, which... I hate I hate singing in front of other people, and I used to be a really good singer. Really, but I'd be. Petrified, but then I also like doing it in big stages. It was very weird. I, don't, I, yeah, I, need, but, to, I need to uncover this. No, but there's interest, something interesting in there with that, right? Which is where you were a really good singer, so therefore you knew you were a good singer. Therefore, there was a more um, chance of failure, right? Yes. So, so therefore, yes. yeah. So it's, it's like um, if you know you're really good at, I don't know. True. Do if you know that you're the best at maths and you yes. always come first at maths, you don't want to have anything but come first math. You, you add so a lot of fear true. into it, so almost you don't want to take the exams to fail. When you, yes. you, you had nothing to lose asking Stephen. And yeah, so there's, yeah. no, there's no worry there. When you have something to lose, it's actually a lot Correct. more scary. So me going up to Leeds, there was nothing to lose because I wasn't in the university anyway. I wasn't going to get true. the offer anyway, so I had nothing to lose. But you don't think like that. But then in terms of drama, I absolutely love drama as well. And I think the reason for all, I like drama was it's that typical thing where it was screaming out to have attention and the fact that you could be on stage and get a, get attention. Mine wasn't the acting where I like to play other characters. Oh. Mine was like I like to be on stage. which was, And that's why, you know, when I went and joined Made in Chelsea, a lot of people have different reasons for saying they did Made in Chelsea, right? Oh, this or that or whatever mm-hmm. it is. I would say 99.9% of every single person doing it is because they wanted to understand what had being famous. They thought they'd be famous. And but, and they thought they'd be famous and that would cure a lot of insecurities. And, uh... and I think it was thinking they would cure a lot of insecurities, right? If you're famous, that means you're going to be popular. And if you're popular, that means everyone loves you. And if you, everyone loves you, therefore you're going to be healed. That's the complete opposite. And it's the complete opposite, Yeah. right? But um, So did you go to Leeds University? So I went to Leeds University. Um, 
which was amazing. But yeah, I just, I do, I really just encourage people, you should, and you know, Woody Allen said it best, 50% of success is just turning up. For sure. You know, you have to just turn up and do mm-hmm. things. Um, but again, going back to your thing is where you got that inner confidence from, which is interesting, is like you exposed yourself to situations you were scared of. Yeah. And I think exposure is the most important thing. If you have a, if someone's listening to right now and they have a sort of three-year-old child who is scared of touching leaves because they don't want to get dirty, make force them to touch the leaves because it gets over their OCD. Mm. Or if you have a fear of public speaking, go and expose yourself to some sort of public speaking, even if it's in front of two people. If you're scared of walking across three drains because you think the world's going to explode, yeah. walk across the three drains. It's so the best true. formula to get rid of OCD as well. Love like that. you just expose yourself to these situations. Um, so I went to Leeds. Leeds was amazing. I did zero work. <laughs> Love Literally this. nothing. Okay. Because I wasn't interested. Yeah. I just was not interested. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, drama, I love drama, but it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It was a lot of written work. Yes. And that was not as fun. And I just didn't enjoy. And what I quickly worked out is that if I didn't enjoy something, then I was not going to be good at it. And that has sort of led me in, 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 in life a lot. So I went to university, did three years at Leeds, um, passed with a or came out with a tutu okay. in theatre and performance. And then came back to London, was living in my dad's flat, and um, I thought, well, I have to go and get a job now. And it, it was so funny. In my head, I I couldn't believe... Because this is, what, how many years ago? I'm 35 now, so this is, what, 14 years ago. Okay. So 14 years ago, the idea of the world was you would leave university with a degree and that degree would get you a job. Yes. And then you would be into the world of working <laughs> and you would just work and that's how you made money. Yes. There was no, no idea of entrepreneurship. That was a foreign term. Like, what is entrepreneurship? Are there entrepreneurs? Like, mm. I, like do that. I, I had no concept of... Um, how to make a life or ex- I just didn't, I, I, you know, I, 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 what did your parents do? My dad runs a travel company and your but mom, he, but he inherited a lot of money. My dad did. Okay, fine. And yeah. your mom? And my mom worked as a secretary and worked, she sold sort of handbags. So there was no like family business. My dad, um, my dad worked in this travel company, but my dad, there, there was, no one was, there was no sort of bi- business structure. No one was talking about business. No one was coming home from a day's work wearing a suit, taking the tie off. There was none of that. Interesting. So there was no, everything was pretty liberal. So did your dad ever talk to you about money and talk to you about business and talk to you about where you want to go? No. It was all my stepdad. So when my parents got wow. divorced, yeah, my parents got divorced. And when I was about 12 years old, a guy called Jonathan Baines. Uh, came into my life, who's my mum's husband now. They've been married for 28 years or whatever it is, or 20 years. Um, And he was the person to allow me to understand this world of business. Um, And I remember we had a car journey once when I was about 18 years old or 17 years old. And he said to me, if we can harness your energy, we can do some good things. And I was like, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. Yeah. Um, and he was the one who created structure and made me understand things. But leaving, uh, I left university and, and um, I knew I had to sort of get some sort of job or, or work it out. But I had this dream to create this sweet company as well. Um, really? Yeah, I had, I, had been to, I had been to New York. Um, I, I had taken a student loan out of a bank. Yeah. Okay. I had taken a student loan out of a bank, which was two, or a student overdraft, which was two and a half thousand pounds. Okay. And I used it to take my girlfriend at the time to New York. And I spent the entire thing. So funny. And I never paid it back. Yeah, no I, way. For, for about three years, I didn't pay it back. And actually, bailifters came to the house, to my parents' house, because I just didn't understand the concept. I didn't know what it was. It was actually a really, and then I, my credit rating was so bad that I couldn't actually go and buy a SIM card. Hey everyone, I'm really sorry to interrupt the episode, but I really had to talk to you about my performance planner. Now, a lot of people said to me, Shivani, why don't you ever promote your own product? And I was like, actually, why don't I? So here we are talking around my performance planner that I made. I was tired of having a separate gratitude journal, reflection journal, and a to-do list. So I combined it all into one product. Now, in my performance planner, you have a structured template which helps you identify the goals that you want, break them down, and then schedule them for every single week to ensure that you hit any goal. 
The left hand side of the page is all around your performance at work and the right hand side of your page is all around your performance with your mind. So you're gonna have a two in one product that's gonna be able to help you plan your day, reflect on your day and do your gratitude and your affirmations and set your habits and track them all in one place. It's three months, it's completely undated, and at the moment, it's on sale on my website at www.myperformanceplanner.com. I really hope that you like the template. Let me know if you use it and tag me in your stories and I'll repost it. Back to the podcast. So did you grow up with a lot of money? Or you didn't know the concept of money or you didn't understand? Um... We, I, I grew up in a, I would say, a privileged household, right? Okay. There's a sort of, there's definitely a, a uh, misconception. I think most people think that I'm heir to McVitie's fortune. Yeah, are you? No. Oh, so sad. I know, it's very upsetting. I thought you were going to give me some free rich tea. Yeah, it's very upsetting. My family helped. Where did that come from then? My family built McVitie's and then sold it in the 80s. And there's something in the UK. My grandma used to work for McVitie's. Did really? You know that? Yeah, in the factory. It's an amazing connection. I know. So my grandfather, Alexander Grant, was an incredible businessman. Or my great-great-grandfather. What happens <laughs> with generational wealth is sort of an interesting thing. And you can sort of Google it. It's called the third generation curse, which is uh, father makes it, son loses it, uh, grandson has to rebuild it. Right. Uh, and that, that happens in the UK a lot. Where in somewhere like Germany, 53% of German businesses are still family run. Mm. They look at generational wealth over and over. But in the UK, we have much more greedy mentality. Okay. And that's why you see these sort of big country estates now being turned into hotels because families have just not looked after their wealth or whatever it is. And my family definitely fell into that trap. My father okay. inherited money, but us kids, no. And, um, but, but you know, we, I was, we lived in a house. We would never have to worry about food. We okay. um, uh, had we clothes on our school, back. Yeah. yeah, went to all school, so all those kind of things. But it wasn't, but I was never also told the concept of money, really. Which is what I was trying to get at. So when you took the student loan out, you didn't really know the concept of it or no. like what happened. How didn't, didn't interesting. Didn't understand it. Just didn't understand it. And, and, that, and, that's, and I think that happens a lot where people, you know, I mean, God, we can go into this sort of archaic system of the school schooling program, which Ridiculous. is where you can't collaborate or copy yeah. or all those different things. And, mm. and they don't teach you about finance or mm. tax or VAT or anything like that. So yeah. anyway, um, took my girlfriend to New York to and I came across a place called Dylan's Candy Bar, which was Ralph Lauren's daughter Dylan Lauren's sweet shop. It was this incredible sweet shop yeah, of mad. just it was just mad. And I throughout my entire life had had this fascination with sweets because as a kid I was always denied them. Never allowed any sweets ever. Okay. So and I was also scared of the dark, so my brother used to tell me stories of Jamie and Sweet World to help me fall asleep at night. So I always Aww. had this dream of creating a world made of sweets. Oh, how lovely. Amazing. So then arriving at Dylan's Candy Bar, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is the world. This is my sweet world. So I wanted to replicate that in the UK. Anyway, came back from that, had this dream of creating a sweet shop called Candy Kittens. That's what I wanted to do. And this was when I was 20 years old. Yeah, I left, left university and in my last sort of term at university. And it... Um, it started off as a, re it's a reality show which was going to be called Chelsea Girls. And then they changed the name to Made in Chelsea. Um, and they asked a group of my friends to go on. But we why? Were, because we were the right age. We were uh, the people who were going to these nightclubs. We were in a certain social scene, I suppose, and we'd all sort of dated each other or knew, we just, it was very incestuous in that way. We'd all dated <laughs> or so kissed or hooked up or whatever it was. Got it. So it was a group of friends who all kind of knew each other. Um, and my friend Spencer and all that lot started doing it and I swore I'd never do it. I was like, I'd never do that show, no ways. No ways I'd ever do that show, which I think a lot of probably people yeah. who did the show did. Um, so came out, I had to go and look to get a job and just didn't want to go and get a job at all because I just thought, I just totally unemployable in so many ways. Um, and Made in Chelsea asked if I wanted to go and join them and start filming. And I ummed and ahed about it for two months. How did your parents feel? My mum is strict, but in different ways. My mum is, is or has been strict in you know, uh, getting up in the morning and making your bed Fine. and things like that, but never strict in anything else. And I don't think they, I honestly, in the night, I think my parents are incredibly selfish and they were worrying about themselves much more than what their kids were doing. <laughs> but my parents are amazing. Yeah. So they didn't really understand what it was. Okay. Oh, our son's going to go and do a reality show on E4. <laughs> sure. Okay. Good luck. Whatever. They, did, they didn't really cross their minds. Okay. Um, 
because they it wasn't they weren't telling me to do anything. But how do they think you're going to survive then? They didn't think about it. But what do they think you were going to do after university? Because you were living in your dad's flat, wasn't he? Like you need to get a job if you're living in my flat, or no? No. Okay, well then I think that is some sort of privilege, no? To be Defin like, well, definitely because I had a place how are you to funding live. yourself? Well, there'd be food in the cupboards. Yeah, okay, fine. And <laughs> you would, you know, I'd go and work certain jobs like at your service, which is a catering company, or I work a couple of weeks at Byron Burger. Your grandmother would give you, I don't know, a hundred quid whenever. For or what, Christmas, yeah. For Christmas or whatever it was. Yeah, so I was yeah. kind of making certain ways, and I think my dad gave me an allowance of like 200 pounds or 300 pounds. So you went on to Made in Chelsea? So I went on to Made in Chelsea. Were they paying you then? You were paid 50 pounds every time you filmed. Stop it. Yeah. That is so funny. Yes, yeah, so you paid fifty pounds. So probably in a season, you would probably film. I don't know how many things. So you'd probably make a few grand in a season. Oh, actually, every time you film, so like every day or every other but day. You wouldn't film every day. So you'd probably film uh, in a season. You'd probably film. Uh, what would it be? I mean, you'd probably film thirty days in a season. So you're okay. making five hundred, a thousand, one thousand five hundred. And how long is a season? Season's probably three months. Okay, and. Everything on there, is it fabricated or real? Uh, it was all real, but... Um, and at the beginning, it was incredibly real. Really? Yeah, because um, you... It was incredibly real at the beginning because we were all friends and we were all having a great time. And I, I didn't understand it. <laughs> I didn't understand what it was because we were just hanging out and having a great time doing it. Um, as the show got on, it didn't become fake in any way, but it you as a cast member felt the need to push yes. more stories yourself. Right. So you would date more with different people on the show. You would um, create more drama because you knew it would be good for the show. You would start to do things that you knew would create a reaction because you knew it would be good for the show. Surely you would know that was going to cause a lot of backlash and criticism though, no? No, because what happened at the beginning is that, so I come out of university... Uh, I decided to go down this road of Made in Chelsea. One person who's a bit of a mentor in my life, who she's been amazing, she was very high up in television, and she told me not to do it. She said, do not do that show, it'll be the death of you. And I said, no, I think it'll be good. And and, and forever I'd always got gone against the grain of what people think. Um, and so I did it. So then when I was on it, I had to make it work. Um, because what happens is you do the first season, right? So you do the first season of Made in Chelsea and you then, every week you have a photo with someone who goes, oh, I've seen you on that TV show, mm. right? And then that for someone like yourself is a bit addictive as well. So you're getting a bit mm. of recognition and you're doing a television show. Um, and then you've done one season. And by that time, everyone who has left university at the same time as you have done six months of finding a job. And you're six months of doing a TV show. Yeah. So you do the next season and then the next season ha season happens and you become a bit more of a profile. So more people are taking a bit more photos of you and that becomes even more addictive. When so you're, you're a bit so more, young as well. And you're so young, you're 22 years old. Mm. But by that point, everyone's been a year looking for a job or they've been six months in a job. And in, I don't know, whatever it is, you can be working in a bar or a restaurant or working in insurance or working mm. in real estate, whatever they've been doing. So you think, okay, fine, but this is a dick. So you're, you're all thinking, oh, God, this can't be forever. I can't be doing this forever. It's just, you know, just a hobby. It's just a hobby. Okay. Then you do another season and then that's another six months. And so then, therefore, it's a year and a half later since you left university and your friends are a year into work. Mm. And so then you're thinking, God, if I start now, I'm a year behind anyone else. But yet this thing is becoming more addictive because you're going on these holidays and you're having a great time. And then suddenly you find yourself, you're three, four years into this television show and you're kind of sucked up into it. Yeah. And you are, you know, I started when I was 21, 22. I'm suddenly 25, 26. And you're doing a reality show. And you're thinking, holy smokes, I now need to make this into a career. Because what am I going to do now? Leave and then I'm that person from Made in Chelsea who right. left. So you then double down on it. And as soon as you start doubling down on it, that's when you have to start treating it like a food chain. And so then you have to become the lion because if you're not the lion, then you're going to be eaten. So you have to cause as much drama as you possibly can, which then has repercussions on your own 
personal state because then you're doing things, you're not living to your true self. Who told you this lion theory? Well, it's just what you realise pretty quickly. Currency is drama. So the more drama you're creating, the the more airtime you're getting, which means more airtime you're getting, which wow. means more you're useful, the more useful you are, the more feel you need, the more popular you are, or the more you're talked about or whatever it is. Wow. And, th and that's why fame in a reality sense is a really dangerous thing, right? So there's a really interesting concept. You know, the, I, I've always said that the, the, the idea of fame came from the god of Famio. And Famio in sort of the classical sense was this god that would um, follow you right. wherever you went. And the more you spoke about Famio, the bigger Famio got. So Famio is kind of the, Famio is the god of gossip, basically. And so fame comes from that term, which is oh. like, if you're being gossiped about, that's how more famous you are. And fame is, is a, probably a good thing if you're a movie star, because you sell more movies. Mm. If you're a comedian, you sell more tickets. If you're a, a musician, you sell more albums. When you're a reality star and you're famous or have a profile, you're just a person on television. You have nothing to sell. Wow. So, and there's never enough of it. You know, it doesn't, if you're into cars, right there's never going to be enough cars you can drive if you're into women or men there's never enough women or men you can sleep with mm. if you're into um being famous there's never enough fame same with money if you're into money there's never enough money you're going to make to make you happy so it becomes a sort of dangerous cycle and what happens is is what happens with a lot of actors right is when it comes to something like made in chelsea or a reality show is you see it a lot with actors where they've acted so many different roles that they sort of lose themselves. Mm. You know, you, likes of Robert De Niro, Daniel Day-Lewis, these sort of very hardcore actors. And with Made in Chelsea or a reality show, it's a volumed up version of yourself. So you go into a scene and you're funny yeah. or you're hysterical or you're angry or what is, and then you look at social media and you see the reaction. You go, oh, that was quite good. I got a good reaction there. Yeah. So I'm going to do more of that. So you realize that I was already quite energetic and humorous, I suppose. So then every single scene, I had to be more energetic and more humorous, more and more humorous. And we would film 156 days a year. So then any scene that I, so every I was filming all the time. This is when the show became really popular. Really popular. And so then when I wasn't filming a scene, I thought I was in a scene anyway. So when I was with my friends or with my family, I thought I had to entertain all yeah. the time. So the only time that I could switch off was when I was sleeping, which is not a good thing. So then that leads to a huge amount of social anxiety because you're basically getting an Uber rating every single time you go into a normal conversation. And I remember the worst was when my, I sat with one of my great friends and he said to me, Jamie, you're not on Channel 4 right now. Why are you behaving like that? And I was like, oh God, yeah, I know. And so... It was it's sort of reality, I would always say, is it's a very interesting space to go. It's an amazing place to create stuff and do things. Um, but it also can lead to, um, it's very heavy on the soul. And when did you think enough is enough? How did you break out of the addiction? Well, I suppose um, I, I'm, I, because of my sort of, childhood I suppose and going to the boarding school and things like that I was pretty resilient right so I, I could cover up what I was feeling mm. right and you just get on with it like having the lump in the throat when I was a kid I could just get on with it right and I suppose after about seven years of doing the show I I sort of I, I had a I had a really hectic moment where um I had something called depersonalization now, depersonalization for people who, who haven't experienced it is basically where your body is dealt with so much stress or anxiety or depression or whatever it is that it goes into autopilot. And you and it can manifest itself in different ways, but a lot of the time you sort of see yourself floating mm. from above and you feel like you're in a dream state and it's pretty scary. And most people think that they're going mad because oh that's God. the only explanation. You feel like you must be going mad. Um, and I had dealt with sort of this this underlying anxiety for so long from doing this TV show um, that it then led to depersonalization. And the depersonalization lasted for six months. So every single time I opened my eyes, I'd feel like I was in this dream state. 
while shooting a TV show and being funny and engaging all the time. And so that was the beginning of me saying, okay, something's not quite right here. I need to try and sort this out. And I just thought I was going mad. I thought that's what was happening. So that was when I was about 27. And so I started going to a therapist. At last, I started going to therapy. And if you can uh, afford it, if you can have access to it, if you can speak to someone, I just encourage anyone to do yeah, therapy. It's the most incredible thing in the it's entire amazing. world. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and I denied it for so many years. And I suddenly started going to therapy and the therapist started telling me perhaps what I was going through and dealing with in terms of reality probably wasn't good for me. Did you tell people you were going to therapy? No. You hid it? Completely. Why? Because I'd always hid my emotions. So always, ever since I was a kid, always hid it. So what urged you to see a therapist? Because I had to. Because I because it was at a point where I, you just couldn't go on. And and still now I'm embarrassed to talk about it. It's so strange. Why? Well... I see it as such a strong thing. Well, I don't know. Something's gone wrong. You want to change it. You want to get better. Mm. It's amazing. It's like you're taking personal responsibility. Well, because when I was 22 years old or 23 years old, I first started doing the show. So the show was brilliant for two series. And then the third series, I had a panic attack. Okay. Um, And I had a panic attack and it's the typical thing. I've said this before, but I had this typical thing where I took myself to hospital. I said I was dying. And the doctor said, no, you're not having a panic attack. And I said, well, what's that? And they said, it's, well, your, your, your adrenaline's going through the roof and you need to calm down and relax. Go and have a Coca-Cola and you'll be fine. Oh. So I went, okay. And so I left and had a Coca-Cola and it didn't calm down. And um, I then had basically what's been described to me now as GAD, general anxiety disorder. And the only way to describe it is for the next six to eight months, I was just living in fear every single day. This huge anger. I didn't know what it was. And I just told no one. I told no one, I told no one, told no one. And then what I realized is actually, oh, if I drink alcohol, that suppresses it. So I would spend my days filming, doing all that kind of stuff. And then in the evenings, I'd, I would go out and drink. Mm. So I was living in this completely hectic lifestyle. And it probably lasted for about six years doing that until 27, yeah, 27 years old. And then the therapist said, yeah, you, you, you're going to end up doing something terrible to yourself if you don't start to be healthy. Um... And I just didn't tell anyone because I thought it was weakness. And I thought that if I would tell someone, I was so scared. I don't think I was saying, I was so scared people were going to discover the real me. So, and that's what a lot of people generally feel like, right? That's where a lot of social anxiety comes from, a lot of anxiety comes from, is that, okay, I'm not, the real me is probably not good enough. So therefore... Um, I need to cover it up with being the loudest person or the funniest person or the most aggressive person or yeah. the person who drinks the most, whatever it is. Um, so I, I saw it as weakness if I was going to say it. And where did that not good enough come from? Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, it, I, I think it was generally because um, you, you're, in a, you're in a big family, parents divorce... And I think my mum probably was so concerned that my dad was probably going to leave that she probably, as a child, she probably neglected the kids a bit. Not in a bad way. My mum yeah. is the most incredible mother. And she has, and she, she was there for me every single step of the way. And my dad's amazing as well. But I think they were so focused on themselves that as a sensitive kid mm. who needed emotion and care and being picked up and loved, that probably wasn't there. So therefore... You, you you felt that you weren't loved. It's, and, I, and, you know, you, they see all the re- studies now. It is so important as a parent to, to love your child. Yes. And to show them love. Yeah. And I think for me, I was told when I was doing bad things, but I was never told when I was doing good things. Yeah. So I think for me, that felt like I was unlovable, maybe. There's two parallels that I draw between you and I. Mm-hmm. One is that, you know, throughout this podcast... Any time I've asked you a question about your mom and dad, you've been so defensive. Mm. So you've been like, they're amazing and I love them. Mm. And I just want to say, like, I felt the same. But your parents could have made a mistake because, like you said, everyone's figuring things out. Mm. And they could still really love you. They might not have known. And you're not saying you hate them Mm. if you didn't agree with their choices, number one. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing you said at the start of this podcast, my brother was everything that I wasn't. And he was so clever. He was so much more clever than me. He studied in Oxford. Mm -hmm. And I just, when he said that, in my head was thinking, well, you just told me that 
you have built Candy Kittens, which is really successful. Mm -hmm. You're starting a new production company mm -hmm. and you do so much other stuff that is like underneath all of that stuff. <laughs> and yet you'll still say your brother is much cleverer than you mm. because of the grades. Mm -hmm. And the reason I asked you about the self-worth thing is because I struggled in school too. And for so long, I thought I wasn't good enough. And for so long, I thought I wasn't clever enough. And for so long, I didn't think I was going to amount to anything. And that self-belief and that self-confidence was so knocked until I started doing the podcast and realized, one, I'm good at it. Two, I found what I've loved. Three, I can work like a beast. And because mm. I was so lazy in school, I was so lazy at university. No one I know that when I went to school with would say, Shivani works so hard. They'd be like, she'll do the bare minimum. Y yeah, and it's, it's so exactly interesting. the same as me. Yeah. Yeah, but um, but it, but I think similar to people who are listening and like you, you have is that you just didn't find your passion, right? That, exactly. That we didn't know our passion. strengths. We didn't know our strengths at all. And yeah. often we were criticised for our strengths, for being loud, for being talkative, mm. for trying to be the funny one, for trying to be the entertainer. And mm. I, I resonate with all of those things. I mean, your parents put pressure on you to achieve, right? Yes, massively. And it was only grades, results. Yes. Results and grades. Yeah. Yes. What, what gave you your self worth that you have now? Truly, by talking about it on this podcast, I mm. say I'm not, I'd never thought I was clever. And people would say, but you're so clever. And I would say, why do you think that? And they'd say, what do you mean? And I recognize that in school, when you're younger, you are judged by two things, how obedient you are and the grades that you get. Mm, your parents will love you if you're obedient. Your friends will love you if you're cool. And everyone will know you in your community or in my community. It was like, oh, what grades does she get? And I just never thought I was going to find something that I was going to thrive in because I never believed in myself in anything. So I, I always look at things like, so I was terrible at maths at school, right? And my ma and I just never did well. And then when it came to my GCSE year, um, I loved my math teacher. He was okay. amazing, called Mr. Wiseman. He was amazing. And he, I liked him, he liked me. And so then I got an A in maths. Yes. Oh, wow. Because, yeah, How interesting. Yeah, because he, he taught me in a certain way I really liked it. And so, so I engaged with it. And actually, I think it's a, it's a sort of, uh, especially in the workplace, I see this in business, is that um, some people come in and uh, you sort of, they either don't get past their probation period or whatever it is. Mm. It's because they feel like they, some people feel they're not good enough or whatever. But actually, it's just about a way of communicating differently to individuals to, to yeah. help them. And actually, I sometimes think it's a failure on the employer's part. Wow. If they don't, if they employ someone and they don't fit in, it's like, no, find a way for them to fit in because everyone can. It's just about communicating them in a certain way. Love that. Yeah, That's it's so really nice. important to do that. Yeah. And, and especially for kids. It's it's like so important for kids. All, so kids can get distracted or, or they can't find their passion or whatever it is. Mm. Um, but, but it's amazing that you found your passion. But the greatest thing for you is that you were able to figure out what you didn't want to do. Yes, after many trial and, trial and errors. But we'll save that for your podcast. Okay, fine, we'll save it for my podcast. <laughs> um, okay, so we were talking about... Where were we? We were talking... so difficult, isn't it? Because we both wanted to chat to each other. It's just so very hard that was it. So to I, stay focused. So I, so I had all these things. So anyway, started going to therapy. Um, and therapy was an amazing game changer for me in so many ways because it made me start talking about things and understanding things and realising what was going on and what I shouldn't be ashamed of and all these and everything. And did you then start to share with your... No. Uh, I never told anyone until I started doing my podcast and then I started speaking about the podcast. Wow. Yeah. And... And then anyway, cut forward to I then met my wonderful wife called Sophie. She is the freaking greatest. She's so funny. She's the funniest person I know. She's so, the greatest person so in the world. Good. And she was doing the show as well. And she'd done it for a year. She didn't like doing the show. And I, she was like, she'd done it for two years. And I was like just such good friends with her. Like amazing friends. Anyway, we, long story short, we fell on fell in love. And I realized that if this was going to work, I would have to leave that television show. And actually it was, again, there's been these moments in my life which are the biggest blessings. She was one of the greatest blessings, not only because I love her and I get to, and I married her, but also because it may, gave me that energy to move away from the show and leave the show. So um, I left Maine Chelsea and uh, had never gone back when I was about th 29, 30 years old. Was that a hard decision? Um, no, it really wasn't. It was actually quite an easy decision. And and by that time, by that time, you know, the show started where, where it was just a group of buddies. It was just a group <laughs> of mates hanging out, having the greatest time. And then what happened was, is it became much, you know, it was people who yeah. had just come onto the show. But meanwhile, alongside all of that time, I had been building this business, Candy Kittens. 
um, which is our vegan confectionery company with my business partner, Ed Williams. So how did that start? Why vegan? Because you're not vegan, are you? I'm not vegan, no. So first of all, I know you have this dream dream world of mm. Candyland, which is why when you were telling me, I was saying that's amazing. And you were saying, yeah, Dylan's is amazing. And I was like, no, it's amazing because you've done it because mm. <laughs> you visualized it. And you said I'm a natural manifesto. Maybe you are too. Because mm. you essentially visualized this thing. Mm -hmm. You named it. Yeah. And then you made it. So you could call it that. But how did that happen? Because starting a business isn't easy. You're telling me that nobody told you anything about business. You told mm. you no one had anything to do with entrepreneurship. Mm. Your stepdad kind of told you a little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. But what gave you the funds to start? Mm. And what gave you the business acumen? Yeah, great question. So um, business firstly is one of the hardest things that, that anyone can ever do. And I, I, I applaud anyone who has um, thought about starting a business, who has started one, who has created one but it's failed, who has created one and sold it, who still runs it. I just admire every single person in that space because the the immense of um, patience and precision and all these different things go into it. So um, I was incredibly lucky because I met a co-founder and actually starting a business is an incredibly lonely place and that's yeah. like something like 72% of people have co-founders. Mm. Um, and I met a guy called Ed Williams and I wanted to launch, I just started doing Main Chelsea, and I wanted to launch a sweet business. Um, and I used to go and do these things called personal appearances. You know, Scott Disick or whoever, <laughs> or myself, turned up to a nightclub. More people go to the nightclub. Yeah, yeah. And so they would get more money. And it's they like would, an influencer event It's now. like an influencer <laughs> event, right. And so I was paid to do those things. And I went to a nightclub in Loughborough, and a guy called Nick, who ran the nightclub, I said, oh, can you, he had a t-shirt company as well. I said, can you make me candy kitten t-shirts? because I want to start creating and talking about this brand. Again, incredibly naive. I just knew that if I spoke about it enough, yeah. people would gather interest, right? And he said, oh, I can help you with that, but you should talk to my housemate. He's a designer. He's called Ed Williams. And so I met Ed in London, um, and then Ed turned up, and he was a designer, and he showed me these designs for packets of sweets. And he said, you shouldn't do a sweet shop. You should make packets of sweets, and we should sell them around the country. And I went, let's do it together. Wow. And we had met for once, the first time, and from that day, we've been working together side by side for the last 13 years. We've never had an argument. We've never split up. Um, he, yeah, touch wood, he is um, one of my greatest friends in the entire world, but we have a very business relationship. Okay. So we don't hang out together that that much socially but we do so he came on my stag when i got yeah. married and he was part, you know he's part of my wedding but we're very business with each other is that conscious no not at all it's just incredibly lucky i i think the less that you can the less you can be emotional when it comes to business the better I agree with you, actually. Yeah, you don't want to have any emotion in it. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting but Some space. people are not like that. They're like, I just like, I like to have loads of work friends and be completely authentic with them. I have a bit of a wall up with work people, too. Yeah, it, it, it's it's interesting, right, also when it comes to running your own business because... Um, you have to set boundaries. Completely, and I'm not good at that. So uh, Steve Jobs supposedly used to call it wearing velvet gloves, mm. which is where you used to be too too nice. Yes. I'm, Ed, is, Ed is much more... Let's get shit done. Let's make this happen. I'm much too nice. So actually, I, so as a combo, we work very well together. Um, and the way that we funded the business at the beginning, our parents thought it was a terrible idea. So they gave us no money. We funded it by me doing these personal appearances. Amazing. So I would go to a nightclub in Bournemouth. I'd be paid a thousand pounds. Yeah. And I would use that and then put, we do put that into the business to buy T-shirts. So then good. we were going to sell the t-shirts. And the way that we launched it was incredible. We launched um, a website with t-shirts on it. And we sold something like £25,000 worth of t-shirts. We then used that money to go wow. and buy the t-shirts. And then we sent out the t-shirts. And with the profit from that, we then started developing sweets. But making sweets, if you go and Google how to make sweets, nothing comes up. So we then had to go to Germany to a sweet convention in Cologne. Actually, it's called the ISM. And it happens every year. We're going, we've done it for the last 12 years. And we went walking around talking to um, different people of how to make sweets. Wow. And we came across this company called Catches, K-A-T-J-E-S, um, who we taste their sweets and they're amazing. We said, look, can you make our sweets for us? And they said, just to let you know, we've just dropped Morrison's because they're not doing enough orders. So you have to order 250 tons worth of sweets, which 
won't make any sense to you, but that's, a, as you can imagine, a huge amount of sweets. So we couldn't use that company. My God. But we found a family-run company who helped us and we started the business. Uh, the sweets were crap. The packaging wasn't good. I remember the packaging. Yeah, you remember it? it I don't think the sweets were crap, though. They weren't amazing. But lots of things happened. And I mean, it was a bit harder. Yeah, it would t honestly take me a whole another hour to talk about it, about what happened and what went on and the ups and the downs. Um, but we, what, one of the most amazing stories was is that I went and did a TV show called um, First Dates to, for Stand Up to Cancer, which is the very famous show First Dates. And it was for a charity and all these kind of things. And I was put on a date with someone called Anne-Sophie. And Anne-Sophie and I got talking. And halfway through, she said, what do you do? And I said, well, I have, a, I have a sweet company called Candy Kittens. And she says, oh, my best friend's dad uh, runs a company called Catchers. And I said, well, I know catchers. I'd been to the sweet convention. We try to get them to make no our sweets. Way. And she said, I'll set up a meeting. <gasps> so she set up a meeting. Her, they, she spoke to her friend. Her friend spoke to her dad. Um, we got in uh, We had a meeting with a guy called Bastian Fassen, who is the CEO and founder. We're well, not founder, CEO and third generation founder of catchers. Um, and from that moment on, we built this amazing relationship. And now they are shareholders within our company. And they're the best manufacturers in the entire world no way yeah just, that is fate well, I what think are so. the chances yeah I, I, what are the chances that could happen but again it, I, I, again it's sort of being a bit of a yes person i suppose putting yourself in situations but you know we can proudly say we're the fastest growing confectionery company in europe and not only that the reason why we went vegan is because ed and i truly believed at the beginning is like we wanted to make sweets with no nasties in them so we wanted to remove animal gelatin people don't know is that when you eat your harry bows your round trees and when you're eating sweets with gelatin in them you're eating Pigs, skin, cows, feet, all these different And vegetarians stuff. don't know that. Vegetarians don't know that either. So we believe that if you... I'm not vegan, right? Yeah. But if you can remove that from your from your product and still make a better product, why wouldn't you do that? So candy mm. kittens are a better product, 100%. They use no gelatin. We have no artificial flavor uh, colorings um, or artificial flavors in it. Um, we're a B Corp, which basically means people, planet and profit is exactly the same value. We think that's vitally important. Okay. You know, we think it's the business. I truly believe it's the business responsibility now to help save this world. Mm. Every It used to be like, you have to clean your yogurt pot out or can yeah. you recycle this? No, it's up to businesses to mm. encourage people to do that. So we're trying to do that. Uh, we're carbon neutral, um, which basically means we offset all of our carbon footprint. Um, and so we're trying to do not everything just to make the best sweet possible, but we're also trying to leave this planet in a better place. We think that is so important too. And it's been, it has been a ride. I mean, my God, it is. And um, yeah, it's been a, an amazing... God, I, I feel like I haven't... Do you know what's so funny? I, I've never, I haven't spoken this much about myself. <laughs> I love it. In, well, you tried to deflect on me many times. God knows we how We spent 20 long. minutes in the beginning talking about me. I hadn't even introduced you yet. I'm, I'm going to have to cut that bit out. No, I'm don't apologise. Running a business yeah. and coming from a privileged background, for yeah. some reason, people just go absolutely nuts I think mm. that with any business it doesn't matter what background you've been from I, I remember interviewing this uh, woman called Shribaka she's founder of Papadou and Preach which is this incredible Indian designer mm. and she said I, I did have privilege my father gave me 10,000 rupees and I turned that 10,000 rupees into 500,000 rupees and I've given half of that away in salaries to people she's like there's months I don't make a profit mm. and there's often a misconception that Business is easy if you have money. Now, you've just stated you didn't get any investment from your parents. I mean, mm. the story that you've told, I think, you know, was so great in detail and understanding that you really did have to figure out everything by yourself. Mm -hmm. What was one of the hardest moments in figuring this out? Because starting a confectionery company is really difficult. I mean, I don't know anyone who's really done it. I mean, Tony's Chocolate is kind of like a new chocolate brand that I see. Mm. And then your Candy Kittens is the other brand that I see is new. Everything else, I feel, is like Cadbury, mm. Galaxy, you know, they've been around for years. Yeah, we've hit the nail on the head there. So I, I suppose there's two things here. Firstly, um, I, 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 being privileged or coming from a privileged background, um, it's not necessarily about the money that's injected in the company, right? Yeah. Because because uh, I, I suppose it doesn't, you know, a lot of you can go and raise capital, right? You can, well, it's hard. It's, it's incredibly hard, right? Yeah. But if you have a good idea, you have a good business plan, um, you're driven and passionate, you can go and raise capital, right? You you can go and do that. Um, 
the 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 difficult thing is is that um if you the, the luck that so is your friend that she's talking about is that she could fall back on something so if her business went wrong correct she had a she still had a roof over her head yes and she still could put food on a table for her kids true and all that kind of thing and i think the real tricky thing about starting a business when um you know, you see a lot of actors, right? The reason why a lot of British actors you see come from um, private school education is because their parents or families or friends can fund them for a while while they're just trying to be a budding actor. Yeah. And they're not having to work in the local Sainsbury's to survive. Yeah. So I think the advantage that I massively had is that if Candy Kittens had failed, I wouldn't be on the streets. Yes. And that is immensely, you, I can't even stress the advantage of that. But I was always fearful that I would lose, lose I, I wouldn't become anything. But um, you're right also with FMCG, Fast Moving Consumer Goods, which I'm in, right, which is confectionery. Um, they're all sort of uh, big, huge, giant companies. So yeah. Cadbury's is 100 and something years or 200 years old, Roundtree's, all these different companies are. And the reason is that is because it's unbelievably hard to get into food and beverage. The margins are incredibly tight. Um, you have to always be sitting on stock all the time. So, yeah. you know, at Candy Kittens, we sit on a million pounds worth of stock because you have to do that oh. because you have to have uh, your supply has to be there all the time when you're supplying to different fa- uh, different retailers. Um, you need to have a problem if a lorry falls over or, or, or crashes or your sweets can't be delivered or something goes wrong or whatever. You have to have backup. So there's loads of things like that. Um, so it's incredibly complicated in those areas. Um, you're also dealing with every single different retailer. Waitrose, Tesco, Sainsbury's, Asda, all these different companies, right, yeah. that you're dealing with. Those companies want to make money. Mm. So you have to please every single one of those people. And so how do you do it? So it's a very complicated mechanism. Um, and how and did you figure that out then? You just learn. The, the, the most boring, basic way of failure for us, is, and I think for everyone is, unfortunately, it's cash. Money's oxygen. It helps you breathe. And it's the most boring uh, thing in the entire world. But it's, it's so true. You have to be on top of your numbers. Mm. And at the beginning, we weren't. You know, I thought if you sold a packet of sweets, you made money, then you can go and sell another packet of sweets and you can do that. I didn't understand the idea of overheads. I didn't understand the difference between gross and net profit. I didn't know what a P&L was. I never read a P&L. I'm still not good at reading P&Ls. Wow. Right? So it, it was incredibly hard. And um, we didn't make profit for 10 years. So we didn't make any, any, we didn't make profit, yeah, for 10 years. What? Yeah. So how did you keep, were you paying yourself a salary though? I didn't pay myself a salary for eight years because I was doing personal appearances. I love this personal appearance life. <laughs> yeah, or I was earning money or made in Chelsea. Interesting personal appearances now like an influencer, about brand deal though. They've just yeah, changed. Yeah, it was, it was just changed. It yeah. was just sort of influencing, right? So I, wow. I, could, I could earn money other places. How did you not give up, though? Eight years is a long time. Because my business partner said to me once, because we went to my stepdad, Jonathan Baines, who helped us. He was chairman of the company. And I encourage anyone to um, who's starting a business to try and find a mentor. Don't listen to people. This is what I, I, I tell you. What Roy Southern told me in a really important thing. He's He works at Ogilvy, yeah. Ogilvy Group. He said, um, uh, when you're setting up a business, setting up a brand, never follow logic. Because logic gets you back in the same place as everybody else. Yes. Uh, a, a place where you where you want to be if you're flying a car, flying a plane, or driving a car. But if you're selling a business, never follow logic. Go against the grain. So never do what anyone else is doing. Um, and we went to my stepfather, who uh, who's chairman of the company, and he is he taught us about um, crossing the T's and dotting the I's and talked to us about structure and contracts and made us treat the business like a, like a, like, even though it was a startup, like a proper business. And he was amazing in that way. But he said to us that this business doesn't work, it's not going to make money. And he says, so you really got to think about it. And we were walking back and, and, not, and, and honestly, we, you know, we were walking back and um, I turned to Ed and, we were about four years into Candy Kins at that point, And I said, Ed, please don't leave me. And he said, if I have to sell sweets for my bedroom, I will. And it was that Ed, more so than me, has had this constant belief that this business is going to work. Wow. And if you are a founder or you're a business owner, you without a doubt have to have that unquivocal belief that you are going to succeed. Yeah. And whatever anyone tells you, because everyone told us that it wasn't going to work, 
um, you have to ignore them and you have to follow your gut and you have to follow what you think is your own logic, not what everyone else's logic is. Um, and the reason that we became successful is because Ed truly believed in it and I followed him and I knew that he was never going to go. So we had this loyalty towards each other um, and we just were persistent. How interesting. This is so linked to what you told me in the start of this podcast with you always thought your mom and dad were going to break up so you were waiting for it. Mm. Or you always thought your, someone was going to leave you and abandon you. So you were waiting for it. Yeah, and yeah, that yeah. translates to your relationship. But your relationship with Ed is you never thought he would leave you. Never. How interesting. Yeah, he never, he never. And so as soon as he said that to me, it was like, okay, we're in this. Let's go. And, 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 and I truly believe is that the reason why people fail is because they give up. And yep. look, you know, it's not, and, 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 and I think failure has like negative connotations towards it, right? But actually, again, it's that cheesy thing that we all talk about. Failure is so important in life. Mm. Um, but if you get knocked down nine times, you have to get up 10. You have to just keep going. You have to keep going. You have to keep going. And what you were saying before it, which is so interesting, is that that constant hustle. Mm. And when you start to, it starts to work, it's incredibly rewarding. It's addictive. It's incredibly addictive. And yeah. you have that now yep. where you're suddenly seeing this success and suddenly mm -hmm. seeing it start to tick and work. And you're like, Jesus Christ. And you grinded it for God knows how long. Yeah. And people don't see that. No, of course. No, they just see the, they used to see the sun's success. Which is, I think, the problem with social media now. Social media is a whole different thing. I think, I think TikTok and social media is, is a really dangerous place because we're all after the viral videos and actually yeah. a viral video is a really negative oh it's a thing. nightmare because yeah. it doesn't get you engaged not the other ones jamie this yeah. is we need to do a part two because how long have we chatted for like an hour and a half have this really? is this has been like a therapy session for <laughs> both of us i don't even think we've covered we haven't even talked about jam pot we haven't covered so much i'm so sorry it's fine. I, I mean, apologize. we'll have. I mean, I, I'm I'm really excited, but also like a little bit. Can worried I ask when you I come a question? Your yeah, go on. <laughs> what scares you most? Yeah, like failing, being nothing again. But then, what are you proud of yourself? What What do you What are you? Oh, proud I was gonna. Of? No, no, you can't ask me a question. Forget that. Do you feel proud of yourself right now? Uh, yeah, I do now. Good. But 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 only bec um, not only because I know I do I feel but I feel my proud of myself in different ways. Um, you know I I'm I'm a very I'm, I think I'm a pretty good entrepreneur. You are. Um, uh, but I I'm very successful in in my relationships now, and for me that is the most important thing, which I didn't realize for so long. Yeah. I thought success came like the usual thing where it came from. Uh, it was financial success or material success. But I'm married and I love my wife more than anything. And I love my friends oh, and my family are awesome. And so nice. and so that for me, so I feel incredibly successful because of that now. Whereas before I had neglected all of that. I broke up with everyone. Mm. I, I I had I had cheated in my past. I neglected my family and I was focused on all the wrong things. Mm. And actually those things, which are right there in touching distance, are the most important things in your life. What a lovely ending. So sweet. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming.